ahead and get started. So I believe we finished my last touches. So returning to <clears throat> page 740 in the 11th edition, 929 in the 10th edition. For God's Grandeur, poem by Gerard Manley Hopkins, who was a priest, a uh, Catholic priest, Je pretty sure he's a Jesuit, um, wrote a bunch of sonnets, and they, they're pretty much all about God and creation. Okay? This is just one of them. We're going to read another one a little bit later. I don't think today. No. Uh, later on this week, hopefully. Um, titled Pied Beauty. So this one's God's grandeur. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod, and all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil, and wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. And for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things, and though the last lights off the black west went, oh, morning at the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with awe bright wings. <clears throat> it's an example, I don't think we've had any others yet. Sonnet form. 14 lines. Uh, I'm not going to go into the rhyme schemes. They're in the section on rhyme that you can read. Two different forms of a sonnet. You have an Italian sonnet, and you have what's called an English or Shakespearean sonnet. The Italian sonnet is composed of an octave and a sestet, so lines 1 through 8, 9 through 14. And at the end of line 8, the beginning of line 9, usually at the beginning of line 9, it's indicated by the first word, you get what's called a volta, which means a turn. A shift in emphasis, a shift in ideas, a but, a nevertheless, however, that kind of thing. Shakespeare, uh, Shakespearean sonnet, or English sonnet, composed of three quatrains, those are four-line rhyming stanzas, and then a final couplet, okay? The thing about an English or Shakespearean sonnet, um, is it can also have a volta. I mean, it's still three quatrains. So the first two quatrains essentially are the octave. And then the last um, one is part of the sestet, etc. So you can still get a, a turn, a shift of emphasis here. All right? Just a little background on sonnet form. So notice what <coughs> Hopkins is saying here. The world, the first sentence. First line is a sense, just a declarative statement. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. What does charged mean? Think of it in the context of the next few lines. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. Okay? But what else does charged imply? This is charged. What does that mean? Full of power. It's full electrical, right? Charged. Like electrically charged. If something is electrically charged, if we had a coil in here, not a Tesla coil, but just a regular, like an engine coil, and it was plugged in so it was getting electricity from the wall, and you had a bare electrode, would it be a smart thing to go up and... No, it would not, because it would zap you, OK? 
Okay? It's charged with the grandeur of God. Dead sentence kind of means what? Well, you got a grandeur. What does grandeur mean? We don't use that word very often because 2023, 20, at times it's hard to look around and see much grandeur anywhere. It's glory. It's this awesomeness. Okay? So the world is charged, full of, like to the brim, with this glory of God, with this majestic beauty. What's the speaker suggesting? What do you need to do to access that? Access it. Go out and experience it. There's been a bunch of studies over the last couple of years that have, that have come out. It said, you know, if everybody would just take a walk in the woods, a lot of quote unquote mental illness, it, it goes away. And it's because we're not experiencing the beauty, the calm, the serenity, all, the grandeur that the natural environment provides. So, it will flame out like shining from shook foil. Your gloss says, shaken gold foil. There's nothing in there that says it has to be gold. Get a piece of tin foil, go out and shake it in the sun. And what do you see? It sparkles like it flames, okay? It gathers, it, the grandeur of God, gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Olives crushed in their oil, okay? Again, have to be olives? Yeah, pretty much, because petroleum oil, you know, doesn't work. How do you crush olive oil? I'm pretty sure there are there are some small batch olive makers. I'm not positive about this, but I'm pretty sure that there are some small batch olive oil makers that crush olive oil the same way vintners, wineries, crush grapes. The old fashioned way. Big old tub, people get in, wash their feet, get in, barefoot, and stomp around. Okay? That's how it used to be. So, it gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Notice all single syllable words. It's ba boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom. Wreck. We never use that verb anymore. If we do, we use it as part of a larger verb. What's the larger verb that has this as the beginning? I reckon. Okay. What do we mean by reckon? That's a word also you seldom hear anymore. What does to reckon mean? If it's used this way, means kind of a judgment. A great reckoning means final judgment is being passed. Okay? Reckon just means think, consider, suppose. I reckon it's okay. It means, you know, it could be wrong, but it's probably okay. Why do men then, so now we go back to the earlier form. Reck, consider, think about, meditate. His rod, okay, to obey God. Generations have trod, have trod, have trod. Why the, repet why the repetition? What do you do when you tread? You walk. But you don't just walk one step. You take another step and another step. You tread and tread and tread, okay? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod. Multiple generations. They just keep going. Trod where? And all is seared with trade. All what? 
all generations, all human life, okay, is seared. What do you do? What kind of verb is seared? I can think of only one instance, maybe two, where it's even used today. So what does that mean when you sear meat? Yeah, you it's a fast it's a fast burn. You heat a skillet or you heat, heat a grill up really hot and you put that steak or that meat on there so it immediately sizzles. You to get that outer side cooked, then you turn the heat down to cook the inside. All right? The only other instance but it's the same image that's used that I can think of is um, John Kerry. When he came back from Vietnam, he said, you know, I have this memory seared in my mind. Meaning what? Burned. So, and all is seared, burned, marked, almost like branded with trade. Everything becomes what? Something to be bought or exchanged. Something to be consumed. Bleared, smeared with toil. If something is bleared and smeared, is it clean? No. Is it untouched? Is it original? Is it not? No, it's none of those things. So now it's marked by toil. And where's man's smudge? What's doing the weary? All. The world. It wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. Now, when Hopkins is writing this, if he's in London, and I don't know where Hopkins lived, but if he's in London, he's in London at a time where London was famous for its smoke and horrible pollution. Dickens, writing earlier, than Hopkins, gives us all of these descriptions, as does William Blake, an author we'll be reading a little bit later, gives us all these descriptions of London, early 19th century. And it is just bleak. I don't mean people, I mean the physical landscape. You've heard the phrase London fog. London fog isn't only natural fog. I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area. Summertime, fog rolls in off the coast, hits the Santa Cruz Mountains, and pretty much stops there. Every now and then it would spill into the Santa Clara Valley, what is now called Silicon Valley. And when it was 100 or 110 two days ago, it might be 75 now, because that fog just stays. It doesn't burn off. That's not the kind of imagery that Dickens and such are using when they're describing London fog. They are describing the moisture in the air, but it's combined with coal pollution. The pollution caused by burning coal and such. Okay, so the smell, the soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. Why is the soil bare? You ever heard of the Dust Bowl back in the 30s? Why was there a Dust Bowl? Partly drought. A big part of it was drought. What was the other part? Anybody know? Crops Louder? Crops dying. Why were the crops dying? Mm -hmm. I mean. Fertile. Yes, why? Go one more step. It had been killed. How do you kill ground? Not with, not pesticide. You plant too much in the same crop. You overuse it. That's why you should let fields lie fallow every, I think the average is like every seven years. You just let whatever is natural grow up. Weeds, etc. You till all that back into the ground, what do you do? You return nutrients to the earth, to the soil. He's talking about ground that has been 
planted and planted and planted and planted and planted until there aren't any nutrients in the soil. If there are no nutrients in the soil, you don't have worms. Worms are what help make soil, you know, fertile and such. So the land is bare now, and we're told, nor can foot feel being shod. So even if the land was fertile, the feet can't feel the soil. Why? Because we always wear shoes. How many of you, when you're not at school, etc., go around barefoot? Probably not a lot. Going, like during summers, high school and younger. Today, as opposed to 50 years ago, a lot fewer people walk barefoot. I mean, I went everywhere as a kid growing up in California. I went everywhere barefoot. Even if the street was hot, you know, you'd learn to walk quickly or jump on the grass if there was grass nearby, etc. His point is, we've become what? I mean, this room is a perfect example. Everything in here is what? Except for you and me. Artificial. There's nothing natural in this room. Just looking around, there's not even a damn piece of wood in here, which is natural. Plastic isn't natural. Concrete isn't natural. That is, you don't just dig concrete out of the ground. Laminate, etc. Okay? His point is, we've made our world what? Nat uh, artificial. Okay? And for all this, the for means despite all this, nature is never spent. What do you do when you spend something? You have money in your wallet. You spend it. What does that mean? <laughs> you use it and you no longer have it. Nature, despite all of this, Despite of man's searing, blearing trade, despite the dead earth or the bare earth, nature is never spent. It's never used up entirely. Why? The world is charged with the grandeur of God. You go back to the first law. For all this, nature is never spent. There, where? In nature lives the dearest freshness deep down things. And I think what he's implying is all you got to do is dig a little deeper. Or, metaphorically, scratch the surface. Which really means what? Look. Look. Look at the real, the real, not this, the real world around you. And though the last lights off the black west went. What? The last lights off the black west. Okay. Sun rises, east sets in the west. So when the last lights go off the west, that is, it is now pitch black. The sun is completely on the other side of the earth. What? Oh, morning at the brown brink, eastward stream. The last lights off the black west end implies what? Sunset. Keep going. What does sunset kind of being used as a metaphor here for? Death. We're going to read a sonnet by Shakespeare. He's going to give, in each of the three quatrains, a different image of death. Okay? One of those is going to be a single day and the sun setting. So, if this is an if, if this is a metaphor for death, and though the last lights off the black west went, O oh morning at the brown brink eastward, yeah, springs. What's the speaker saying?
resurrection, rebirth, the new beginning, little orphan Annie, the sun will always come up tomorrow. Okay? Oh, morning as the brown brink eastward springs. So when things look darkest, why do people commit suicide? Because it looks totally dark. There's never going to be any more daylight. So as dark as it gets, our speaker says, it's starting to do what? Over here. Metaphorically. Well, both literally and metaphorically. It's pitch black here, but if you turn the other direction, there's a word for that in English. It's a religious, usually only used in a religious context anymore. It didn't used to be. To repent means to turn around. So if all you're looking at is utter darkness, maybe turn around in light on the eastward springs. Why? Because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and ah, bright wings. Go back to the beginning of Genesis when the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the earth. Okay? But notice the Holy Ghost over the bent world. Why? Well, the earth is curved. But what else is meant by bent? If you've ever had a bicycle and Something happened, you hit another bike, a car hit you, whatever, one of your tires probably went out of, but you know the word I'm looking for? True. The reason tires have spokes isn't only to hold the hub there that, you know, you can fasten to the axle. The spokes keep the frame of that rim. They keep the plane of that rim True. If you take a half dozen of those spokes and you loosen them, the frame will do this, or the wheel will do this. It'll get out of true. You loosen enough of them, it'll get so out of true that the rim will hit either side of the forks that's holding it. Okay? So, true means straight. It can mean upright. Bent means the exact opposite. So the world, in a sense, metaphorically, is no longer true, meaning it's no longer what it was made to be. It's no longer right, correct. It's bent. And so the Holy Ghost bends over it to do what? To rebirth it. Like a hen over its chicks, over its eggs, births those chicks. Okay? Go from there to this one, we're gonna just real quickly. Actually, I'm not gonna talk about it. Jabberwocky, page 743. Lewis Carroll, real name, Charles Lutwidge Dodgson. Um, on a quiz, if you give me either of the names, that's fine. If you say Lewis Carroll, that's fine. If you go for Charles Lutwidge Dodson, that's fine too. This is an example of a nonsense poem. Carroll was known, for, I mean, through the looking glass and the adventures of um, thank you, Alice in Wonderland. Just um, are both examples of nonsense literature, okay? Interestingly, anybody know what Lewis Carroll did for a living? He didn't write. That was kind of a hobby. Professor of geometry at Oxford. J.R.R. Tolkien says, the reason Carroll could write such great fantasy, nonsense stuff, was because 
he had such a logical, rational mind. Tolkien argues all fantasy is based on reason and logic. It's not just sheer escapism. So, if you read Jabberwocky, in one sense, it makes perfectly good sense. That is, it's not nonsense. In what sense does it make perfectly good sense? Everything in here is grammatically correct. There aren't any errors. The problem is what? What's Brillig? What's Slithy? What's Toves? What's Gyre and Jimble? What's Wabe? Well, Gyre, that kind of, you know, moves in circles. So there's one we can kind of figure out. Mimsy, Burrow Goes, Mom Rads, Outgrabe? The hell is he talking about? You don't know. But you do know, t'was Brillig. Brillig has to be an adjective. It's describing something. In the slithy toes, toes, uh, slithy is an adjective. It's modifying toes. But we don't know what those are. So there are adverbs and adjectives and nouns and verbs, etc. It's just <coughs> nonsense because we don't know what the meanings of any of these words are. There was actually a short film done on this. I, I remember being in the theaters to see, I don't remember, something back in the 70s. And this came up first. It wasn't real short. It was like 45 or 90 minutes. I mean, somebody added a bunch of stuff okay, to it. But it still didn't make a lot of sense. So why does he write this? He's playing with sounds. He's playing with words. He's playing with categories. The real impact of this is just the sound of it. Twas brillig in the slithy toves, the gyre and jimble in the wave, a mimsy where the borough goes and the moan rads out grave. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Notice, those two lines make perfectly good sense. Beware the jub jub bird and shun the frumious bandersnatch. Okay, a bird, uh, none of the rest. He took his vorpal sword in hand, long time the manxome foe he sought, so rested he by the tum tum tree and stood a while and thought, etc. Now, a lot of the words that are in here, this is one of the words in your book in bold, are portman, that's a U, portmanteau words. I do this all the time when I'm talking, lecturing. My brain's moving faster than my mouth, and I'll start to say one word, and my brain's already at the next word, and I jam the next word to it, okay? That's exactly what a portmanteau is. You take part of one word, part of another word, and stick them together, okay? We have all kinds of those combined words in English. Something, anyone, right? That's what those are. But those make perfectly good sense because we use them all the time. If we were to create a meaning for these words and then use them, they would enter the English vocabulary. Okay, all I'm going to say about Jabberwocky. 780. Because I want to try and get us up to what we're actually supposed to be doing today. 780. Two poems by Shakespeare. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day, and my mistress' eyes are nothing like the sun. Okay? So, very much English Shakespearean sonnets, three quatrains, a couplet. The couplet, in Shakespeare's hands, almost always is a summation. It's like point one, point two, point three, therefore. Okay? Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? By the way, within Shakespeare's sonnets, this sonnet is probably addressed to a young man. He writes 154 sonnets. There are three individuals, so to speak, in the sonnets. There's the speaker of the sonnets. Never assume the speaker is Shakespeare. Never assume the voice of a poem is the author. It's always some kind of created persona or speaker. You use persona or speaker to describe the voice of a poem, use narrator to describe the voice of 
a work of fiction, short story, novel, thing like that. So you have the speaker of the sonnet, you have what's called the golden-haired youth, the young man, and a dark lady, a black woman. Okay? About the first 126 sonnets are generally about or between the speaker of the sonnets and the youth. The dark lady is implied in some of them. Okay? 127 to the end are generally to or about the speaker and the dark lady. His physical mistress, right? A lot of contention. What's the relationship between the speaker and the youth? More contemporary critics, many of them, want to say there's a homoerotic, there's a gay relationship between the two. I don't think there is. I think it's entirely platonic because it's not in here. One of the sonnets talked about talks about the creation of the golden-haired youth left him with a penis, and the speaker says, in that, um, how's the way he put it? That left me with nothing. In other words, I didn't want you in your creation to have a penis. I wanted you to have a vagina so that I could take pleasure in you. But you are now for women's pleasure. Your friendship, your mind will be my treasure. Okay? Anyways, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Usually included in collections of, you know, the 100 greatest love poems. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Temperate and date rhymed in Shakespeare's day. They'd be more like temperate than that. Okay? <clears throat> Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dim. And every fair from fair sometime declines. By chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor shall death break thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So let's stop there. Should I compare you to the summer? And the speaker says, hmm, let's think about that. You're more lovely and more temperate than a summer's day. How? I mean, most people like summer. But summer can be what? Think Murfreesboro, mid-August. It's usually not lovely or temperate, right? It's hot, it's humid, etc. Well, Shakespeare didn't live in Murfreesboro in August. He lived in London for 20 years at least. So let's talk about London. I've been in London for, I don't know, eight summers, at least for a month, over eight different years. I was there when London twice hit its hottest temperature on record. 99 one year and 101 another year. It hit 104, I think it was last year, all time high. Um, and I've also been in London when the average temperature has been about 55, 60 degrees from first week of July to first week of August, which means at night, you're talking 40 to 45, and during the day, 70, 75, all right? So more temperate <laughs> means what? Even. Because London can be really hot, it can be really cool. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, spring storms, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. So darling buds of May leading into summer, okay? And summer's lease, when does summer technically end? September 21st or 22nd, okay? Not in London. Summer's over in August. By the last week of August, it has already started to cool off. Trees are losing their leaves, all right? So summer doesn't last for, I mean, the birds go crazy if they don't get a, a couple of good hot weeks because it's often cool through June, July, August might warm up a bit and then it starts cooling off again. 
sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, right? When it gets really hot and you don't get any breeze or any break. Understandable. And often is his gold complexion dim. Sometimes there are clouds. Shakespeare lived during, most of his, all of his lifetime, was during what's called part of the maunder, I'm trying to get the right phrase, the maunder minimum. This is when the sun, for some reason, we have no idea why, went into a very silent or unactive period. No sunspots. And it resulted in cooling here. When climatologists talk about global warming and all that, most of them, the vast majority of them, do not talk about solar cycles at all. All they talk about is what we do. Solar cycles are hugely important. The Maunder Minimum lasted for about 150 years. It resulted in snow in parts of England in June during that 150 year period. It went from like 1650 to about 1800, okay? I think those are roughly the year, years. No, 1550 to about 1700, 1750. So, often it's gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometime declines. Fair there means beautiful. Every beautiful thing from beautifulness or beauty sometime declines. That's part of the carpe diem mentality. Why? Age. By chance or nature's changing course un trimmed untrimmed shakespeare's using that word in a word that we don't use it today first of all we don't say untrimmed at all we only use trimmed in the shakespeare in the sense shakespeare is using it two times of the year thanksgiving and christmas you have thanksgiving turkey with all the trimmings that is all the additional food that goes on the table to ornament the table. And then trimming the Christmas tree. Decorating the tree. So if it's untrimmed, it's what? Undecorated, unornamented, unbeautified. The beauty dies. By what? Chance? Freak accident? Or nature's changing course. Remember the other day when I was talking about um, Dunn's valediction forbidding morning and, and I had up here, you know, the earth and the moon surrounding it and everything from the orbit of the moon down to earth is sublunary and that's governed by change. Everything down here changes. But thy eternal summer shall not fade. How can summer be eternal? Nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, owns. Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade. What? How is the speaker going to keep the person being described from dying? When in eternal lines to time thou growest. And that's probably a pun. I mean, there's more than just that. But there's a pun going on. Why? What happens to your face as you age? And the rest of your body? Wrinkles. Okay? Eternal lines? How many wrinkles are you going to have if you live physically in this stuff eternally? You're going to be a wrinkle. That's it. So, nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. Why is it a pun? Because that isn't the only kind of lines. Lines of poetry. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long live this and this give life to thee. So, as long as there are men and women, he doesn't mean only men. 
as long as there are people alive and what? And they have eyes that can see. And it doesn't just mean they have vision. It means eyes that can perceive this what? So long lives this, this poem. And this does what? This poem gives life to the person being described. So, according to Shakespeare's speaker, we've just done what to the person being described? It's kind of like the brown light in the East Springs. We've just resurrected this person. Not physically, metaphorically, spiritually. Why? Because we just read a description of this person and we have created a mental image. And as long as we can keep doing that, this person will live eternally. Okay? Go from there to, my mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. So, shall I compare thee to a summer's day is Sonnet 18 in Shakespeare's Sonnet Sequence. My mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun, is sonnet 130. This is addressed to or about the dark lady. Okay. Sting, by the way, in the late 80s, late 80s, yeah, 86, 87, um, did a song after he had broken away from the police, did the group, not the other, um, did a song titled, My Mistress Eyes Are Nothing Like the Song, Nothing Like the Sun, and also had that as an album title. It's a really good album, by the way. My mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done? If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. I have seen roses damaged red and white, but no such roses see I in her cheeks. And in some perfumes is there more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. It's my absolute favorite line in all of Shakespeare's sonnets. In the breath that from my mistress, look at the verb, reeks. Okay, we'll talk about it. I love to hear her speak, yet well I know that music hath the former pleasing sound. I grant I never saw a goddess go. My mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. Shakespeare is creating here. An anti-blazon. Remember when we discussed um, to his quiet mistress? And the speaker talks about his beloved. And he says, you know, I'm not going to love you at any lower rate. You know, a hundred years would go to her forehead and eyes. Two hundred to adore each breast. But thirty thousand to the rest. And an age to every part. And the last age would be for her heart. That's a blazon. It's a category cataloging of the beloved's beauty. Shakespeare is going to take that and turn it on its head. Why? Black, dark skin, was not considered beautiful in Shakespeare's day, in the Elizabethan period. What was? This. I don't mean this. Not this kind of white. This kind of white. I could walk around a room to everybody in here, and nobody would be what? Beautiful according to this kind of white. Why? It's totally artificial. There's no reality to this, which is something Shakespeare and other poets hammer again and again and again, that the idea of beauty in their day was artificial, and it could be created. Anybody could get white paint. Anybody can get white powder and make themselves beautiful. So Shakespeare is turning that. My mistress' eyes are nothing like the sun. It was thought the image of beauty was that their eyes would be bright, not golden, not white, but the eyes, the, the beauty's eyes would be like the sun. Well, what happens if you look at the sun? You go blind, why? You're dazzled. Her eyes aren't like that. They're the opposite. They're black. 
A sonnet, 127, it's not in here, is all about her eyes being black, okay? Coral is far more red than her lips red. Coral is only red where? When it's alive in the sea. You cut off a piece of coral and you take it out of the ocean. Where in the ocean does it grow? What part of the ocean? Whether you're talking Atlantic, Pacific, Indian, etc. I think yeah, Indian yeah, has this. The tropics. Coral doesn't grow up in the North Sea or in the Baltic Sea or in the Irish Sea. Water's too cold. Shakespeare's experience of coral would have been after it had been removed from the ocean and taken to England. We used to have a piece of coral. I don't remember what happened to it. You take coral out of the ocean and it, over time, does what? Loses its color. It will become like bone, white. Coral is far more red than her lips are red. So if coral, in Shakespeare's hands, is kind of whitish, what's that telling us about her lips? It's disgusting, okay? If snow be white, why then her breasts are done? Which one did I bring? Nope, that one won't work. Dirty dishwater color. Dark. She's black, okay? Hairs be wires. I have no idea what kind of wires Shakespeare is talking about. They didn't have electricity. They would have no need for wires. So... Cable? Eh, possibly. If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. The ideal of beauty, again, blonde hair, curly, wavy, blue eyes, fair skin, red lips and cheeks, nice white, perfect teeth, which I don't know how you get that if you know anything about English culture and the memes about English dentistry. It's like they don't know what they are. Um, Okay, white breasts, etc. So I've seen roses damaged red and white. Damaged just means very varied color. But no such roses see I in her cheeks. And in perfumes is there more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. What kind of stuff do, do we use the verb reek for? Yeah, okay, I mean what kind? Get some good vegetable and fruit material, let it rot, put it in the bottom of, bottom of a garbage, garbage can, and put it out in the sun, hot sun, for about a week. And then stick your head in there. I think that's the image he wants to convey. And she has a horrible voice. I grant I never saw a goddess go. My mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. Part of the ante blazon. Now Shakespeare's writing within the sonnet tradition. Sonneteers before Shakespeare, they all wrote sonnet, many of them wrote sonnet sequences about a speaker's love for the beloved. The beloved, the woman, and all the speakers are male, and all the beloveds are women, or female. All the speakers describe the beloved as a goddess. She's compared to Venus, she's compared to Aphrodite, she's compared to a star. One of the most famous sonnet sequence was called Astrophil and Stella. Astro, astronomy, star, Phil, lover of, comes from Greek, and Stella, star, star lover and star. Okay? He compares her, her to something so far removed from all of us because of her virtue and her beauty and her righteousness and all that kind of stuff. Look at Shakespeare's speakers, beloved. I grant I never saw a goddess go. I've never seen a goddess. My mistress, when she walks, and mistress has two meanings, it means the one who does command my passion, my boss, essentially, and the one I'm sleeping with, when she walks, treads on the ground. And probably by having walk and treads together, 
the way this is often interpreted, this Shakespeare speaker is implying his mistress is a hooker. Okay? Remember when we were talking about Hamlet and Hamlet calls Polonius a fishmonger? And he says, you know, you shouldn't, you can never be as honest as a good fishmonger. And he's like, what? Well, you go to a pimp for what? Solely to get sex, okay? So she's a hooker, possibly. One interpretation. And yet, final couplet, summation, and yet by heaven. That's an oath. By God. I think my love as rare. Love there, my affection for her, as well as the object of my affection, as any she, these other goddesses, these other mistresses that I've talked about, belied with false compare. In other words, Stella isn't rare. Why? Because she's part of this whole tradition of being compared to goddesses. But, and by the way, this is almost always interpreted or read biographically, this sonnet sequence. That is, the, the speaker named Astrophil in the sequence is probably Sir Philip Sidney, the author. And Stella is probably this woman named Penelope Devereux, who married a man named Rich, because in the sonnet sequence, a third person is introduced named Rich, who Stella marries and breaks off the burgeoning relationship between them. That actually happened in Sidney's own life. Okay? I think my love as rare as any she belied with false compare. Rare. Original. Unique. What's the speaker really saying? My mistress? She's real. I get to go bed to her, go to bed to her every night. All these other guys, their mistresses are what? They're fantasies, man. They're up here in their ideas. A fantasy, idealized woman, doesn't keep you warm when it's cold. Okay? Um, turn from there to. Oh, go back. 660. Don't think we'll get through. No, we won't get through all of this, but we'll get it started. <coughs> John Keats, <coughs> Ode on a Grecian Urn. This is in a section kind of on odes and such. Um, you got the description of Ode in the text. You know, it's it's a dignified, has a dignified tone and style, and it's on kind of a lofty idea. Okay? The rhyme patterns, the stanza patterns can all vary. Keats, look at his years, 1795 to 1821, died when he was only 26. He died of TB. Okay? He and Shelley also died young. Shelley didn't die of TB, however, and they were close friends. Okay? This is written just a couple of years, or published just a couple of years before he dies. A Grecian urn. What's a Grecian urn? Sheep wise. Probably looks like that. And this one has probably in it three panels, three sections. I would swear, if I had money in my wallet, which I never do, I, I would be willing to lay money on a table that I've seen the urn that's described at the British Museum, okay? You get online you, and you can search through, you know, not all of them, but you can search through some of them. But you can't find this one. I'm, however, I'm positive that when Keats wrote this, he had an actual physical urn in his mind that he's describing. Because what's going to be described, and we're not actually going to get into it because it's already 854. What's being described are these three images in their images of 
either nature or people in nature. Okay? We have a woman who's being chased by a young man. We have a guy playing a flute, a panpipe, essentially. We have a cow being led to slaughter by a priest and these townspeople. And off in the distance, in the background of the landscape image, is the town emptied out. But every one of these images, as any image does, like, you know, this image, it does what? How does it, any image capture what is being imaged? Or what does it do to that image? If, if some of you had your phones out right now, you know, and you were recording like this thing is, it captures, supposedly, my other computer, it's all stock frame. It captures you moving, right? Live, live streaming, etc. A photograph does what? It freezes a moment in time. Similarly, these are frozen moments in time. So time stops. The images, therefore, become eternal outside of time. As long as the thing exists, okay? So that's pretty important to bear in mind as you reread or read over Odin, the Grecian Urn. We'll talk about um, it in Ode to the West Wind on Wednesday. I think we'll be able to get through both of those and probably at least one of the poems by Frost. All right, we'll stop there. Wake up.